you know, wh when I think about the, the risk of interest rates and that whole narrative that most people were referring to as higher rates for longer, um, I think that's the case with inflation specifically. And we can get into that, but inflation to me is is the main reason why I believe emerging markets would do better than developed markets, where I believe the natural resource industries would do better than the the, the you know, the traditional businesses in general, particularly technology. Um, I think that's going to create opportunities in FX markets too, uh, given given that setup. And uh, and and there's going to be outflows from, you know, especially foreign investors that have fully allocated capital into U.S. equities that are yet to um, transition away from that. And that rotation will create a lot of opportunities as well. Welcome to Thoughtful Money. I'm its founder and your host, Adam Taggart. Recent inflation reports show that it's proving sticky, stubbornly refusing to recede down to the target rates that central banks are shooting for. But rather than simply staying sticky, could it actually start surging again? Today's guest expert thinks it could due to growing global economic imbalances. If that happens, what would the implications be? And what can investors do proactively today to prepare? For answers, we turn to macro and commodities expert Tavi Costa of Crescut Capital. Tavi, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Adam. Looking forward to this. Thanks, Tavi. It's a total pleasure having you on. Uh, I think this is your first appearance here on Thoughtful Money. It will definitely not be your last. I uh, appreciate <laughs> very much you coming on the program here. Um, I follow your work religiously, Tavi. You are um, a prolific uh, publisher of analysis, um, but one of the things that I think you really do as a huge service to macro uh, students like myself is you produce really just some of the best charts out there, hands down, that really help us visually understand what's going on. Um, so uh, I've been reading a lot of your recent uh, work, and and I saw uh, you you put out this. Um, I don't want to call it a warning uh, necessarily, but but a thesis that inflation could really start uh, ramping back up here. I want to dig into that with you. Before we do, though, can we just jump off at, at the general question I like to ask you when, when we sit down and talk, which is what's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, that's a good question. Thanks for having me, Adam. I think that there's there's a, a lot of things, uh, obviously, that comes to mind when I get asked that question. Um in the commodities industry, I think we've been in a consolidation period for some time now, and it, it's interesting how the commodity space usually works through uh, a cycle. Um, and it's, you know, usually you have a few commodities that are hot and then others that are not as hot anymore. So you got cocoa right now, orange juice was the hot commodity not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And then you see the new ones like gold and then oil has been in a consolidation for some time. And, and so, but they all kind of work together. Um, and to me, that is that is a, a big picture of of where inflation is going to fit into as we see hard assets continue to improve uh, in terms of uh, of appreciation. Um, regarding the economy itself, I mean, we've been in a, a place. I thought we would have been in a, in a recession already, but the 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 reckless amount of fiscal spending has been you know, certainly uh, outside of uh, I think. Uh, of I think has been one of the, the big components of why we haven't seen a, a bigger uh, deceleration of, of growth in the economy um, and potentially what's been driving all that. And, and the other thing has been certainly the, the leadership on the mega caps. So my assessment of that is that that leadership is is to me a problem. I mean, that lack of of of, of companies actually uh, leading the market in a large way, overall speaking here in, in the U.S. economy, especially seeing the divergence of small cap companies, equal weighted and other, other parts of the market relative to the larger par portions is, um, you know, it's something to be aware of. We're starting to see a deceleration as well or, or a deterioration of the labor markets, which I think is an important one. And I think gold is sniffing something. I mean, it's clearly, um, you know, something that uh, none of us really know what it is, but we all suspect that it has to do with further debasement of currencies and, and, and other issues. And so now we're in this environment where, um, you know, there's definitely a, a speculation uh, uh, multiples in, in most uh, of the equity markets. I would put into buckets. It's, it's technology, consumer discretionary are the big sectors that are probably driving most of the valuations in markets right now, in particular the mega cap ones. Um, and, you know, 
we've seen some movement towards the the metals and mining industry recently not nothing like we think to the degree that we think and certainly the reshoring is becoming bigger than the green revolution um and it's hard to believe that we're going to see construction spending to the levels that not only we've seen in the last 12 months but that we will probably see in the next 10 years without making you know the metals and mining industry much larger so I know I'm going all over, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, those are most of the, the, the thoughts that I have. And, and you know, when I think about the, the risk of interest rates and that whole narrative that most people were referring to as higher rates for longer, um, I think that's the case with inflation specifically. And we can get into that, but inflation to me is, is the main reason why I believe emerging markets would do better than developed markets, where I believe the natural resource industries would do better than the... the, the you know, the traditional businesses in general, particularly technology. Um, I think that's going to create opportunities in FX markets too, uh, given given that setup. And uh, and and there's going to be outflows from, you know, especially foreign investors that have fully allocated capital into U.S. equities that are yet to um, transition away from that. And that rotation will create a lot of opportunities as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would... Kind of that script there is kind of like the opposite of what's going on right now. So that would create a lot of opportunity for folks who anticipate that if it indeed happens. Um, so, yeah, so it sounds like um, inflation is kind of uh, the lens that you're you're looking through most right now. Why don't we just go straight to that? Um, what are the reasons why you see it heading higher? Um and uh, and maybe if I can just ask you in your in your answer to address you, you talked about how, in your opinion, uh, the reckless fiscal spending is what's been sort of pushing off the economic slowdown, at least here in the States. Um, presumably, you, you you can't just do all that fiscal spending w without any implications. There's got to be some price to pay. Is inflation the price you pay for that? Yeah, I, I think that's what it is. And I would say I used to categorize inflation in uh, what I used to call pillars of inflation, and I still call them that uh and they're all specific parts of it there's the chronic underinvestments in natural resource industries just looking at the capex for producers and commodities it looks very obvious that companies have underinvested um the second one is what's happening with the labor cost um you know we're seeing protests um you know when and and not only that but folks requiring higher compensations and all sorts of things and that's you know, to me, that's uh, something similar to what we saw in the in the 1940s. The reckless amount of fiscal spending is also playing an important role here. Um, and I think the most important ones is uh, of the pillars is deglobalization, uh, which you know potentially started in 2015, 2016 between U.S. and China tensions, and that kind of escalated to all these other issues that you know, in, in especially conflicts between regions and countries that we haven't seen in centuries, and now they're coming back and becoming more prominent. Um, now, to me, uh, I would say that there are some new trends going on. I think three months ago was a lot harder to uh, make the case that we would see a, a reacceleration of inflation. And, you know, learning from the 1910s, the 1940s, and the 1970s, I think the big lesson was that inflation develops through waves. And you know, I, I'm a firm believer that that model will work again today. And so not only from a math standpoint, but also um, from a psychological uh, perspective of business owners and also consumers. And so um, now we're seeing the conflicts at the Red Sea causing the freight costs to go higher. And people start seeing those things as, as unique you know, uh, things and, uh, and, and they're not, they're all really, uh, interconnected in a, in a bigger picture. Um, and, and then you have, you know, today, in fact, agricultural commodities, uh, surpass the levels that they did, uh, reach back during the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, you know, that's going to have an impact in, in food prices, ultimately, in my opinion, um, we're seeing gasoline prices is starting to rise as well. Um, and, you know, all those things are going to be uh, important, but there's one more that I would call perhaps the fifth pillar of inflation that is even more important than all this, which is what's happening with immigration. You know, there's 
Um, immigration, illegal immigration is increasing in the U.S. in a, in a way that we haven't seen uh, probably ever. This is really unprecedented in terms of the, the number of people uh, coming to the United States and, uh, and mostly illegally. And, and that will ultimately drive, you know, shelter costs. And that's, you know, I think that that's going to be a large component that will surprise a lot of uh, uh, inflation, uh, 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 I say deflationistas that think that shelter costs is actually going to go away in terms of the pressure to the upside of uh, consumer goods and services. I'm actually of the opposite view on that front. I actually think that shelter costs is going to be pressured to the upside given the size of the population uh, actually increasing and demanding place a place to live. And so uh, that's going to be, and you can read all sorts of academical reports in, in regards to, uh, to that type of, uh, of, of immigration change uh, in, in, in a country and, and the types of uh, uh, consequences that it, it tends to lead to. And, and one of them is inflation, without a doubt. There are other things as well, potentially, you know, the, the risk of, of crimes and other things also could be could be the case here, but I think the main one certainly is the cost of living is going to have to be uh, also um, you know increased. And so as we see that occurring, um, I would I would think that inflation will reaccelerate uh, in a much bigger pace, uh, faster pace. And and the second thing that will probably be part of the narrative, uh, and 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 it hasn't really participated, but I just can't believe it wouldn't. Um, is is oil, you know, and oil oil is interesting because it was a very um, hot. Uh, narrative back two years ago or so when Russia invaded Ukraine and and all sorts of other things kind of led to uh, oil prices going to $130 a barrel. And today, you know, we're, we're back below uh, 70s or so, at, right in, in the 70s, 75. Um, I think that there is a very important level on oil. If we do surpass $85 a barrel, I think we're going to see a reacceleration in oil prices, energy prices in general, very similar to what we've seen in gold, um, and and I I think that's going to be a, a big part of the reacceleration uh, of inflation narrative, uh, and so that's one way to kind of express that view that on something that hasn't happened yet, uh, that I think is highly probable to uh, to occur. Um, so yeah, a lot to unpack there, but those are some thoughts on inflation that I think will. Uh, be very critical to uh, uh, how we manage money, but also uh, how investors will be uh, pricing assets moving forward. Okay, so um, how much of this is looking over the next decade and just saying, I think we're going to have secularly higher inflation for all of these pillars that you mentioned? And, and how much of this do you think, you know, we're starting to see now with with the difficulty of trying to push inflation down below three like like is this a tomorrow problem that you're talking about or or is this game already starting well and and adam i think you know uh uh unfortunately a lot of my my charts and research a lot of people try to day trade a lot of those things i feel like this new generation and as a <laughs> as a, a reflection of the speculative environment we're in uh think that they can make money so quickly on things and no it's not it's nothing that will happen tomorrow i think this these are uh big macro trends that are developing over time that will create and unleash a lot of trends that also would be very opportunistic for from an investment standpoint uh but you know i i think that the biggest one in terms of inflation uh being higher for longer and i just mean what i mean by that is if you look at um annual rate of inflation per decade, I just think that this decade will actually be higher than historical standards. And the prior decades that we've seen this was 1910s, 1940s, and 1970s. Uh, everyone can claim, and, and I don't disagree, that all those were, were somewhat different than today. You know, they, you know, in the 70s, we didn't have the debt problem. Um, we had the, the issue with labor costs increasing and some deglobalization issues that caused, you know, the oil embargo situation and some others uh, in the 40s. You know, in the early parts of the 40s and late parts of the 30s, we kind of had the World War II that also mm -hmm. caused inflation in a big way. But then we had a more globalized environment. That was a peak of deglobalization that was very different than today, in which also the banks had to buy U.S. treasuries, restore financial repression, 
um, all sorts of things were playing and and actually the gold and the dollar were pegged. And so it was a very different environment, much more disciplinary, believe it or not, than today. Um, and then the 1910s was, you know, you had the pandemic that happened, you had the World War One, all sorts of things happened there as well. But it was also more discipline. Uh, 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 there was a lot of more discipline from a mon monetary uh, uh, a policy perspective and, and, you know, compared to today. And so what what are the things that happened in those decades that is important? Those are important takeaways. Well, first of all, hard assets did really well. Not only hard assets, but hard assets, uh, companies that produced those assets did, did quite well relative to the overall market. What is different about today, not from a debt perspective, which we saw in the 40s, is definitely the fact that we have valuations really extreme in financial assets. We didn't see this in the 1910s and 1940s or the 1970s. And so it is a little tricky to think about, you know, if inflation really is going to be higher for longer and historically higher relative to other the prior decades here, then what does that mean about financial assets being so already frothy in terms of valuations? Can they return even more? Than what they have done in the last uh, ten years or so, you no. Know, and I would I would be very cautious about that because knowing how inflation works, it usually causes the cost of capital to rise, and cost of capital then uh, you know helps you to understand how to discount a business. And if you interest rate is higher, your discount rate is higher, then the present value of that asset has to be lower. And so you know ultimately, I would think that that has to impact the valuation of companies, particularly the ones that have very frothy valuations. But the, the real opportunity, if you think about this, is you know we all like to kind of look at the, the big short idea, right? What happened in the big short in 08 and the banking crisis and all that, and kind of think about that framework today. But the big short really is the debasement of currencies. I mean, there's, there's no way around this. It's uh, the monetary dilution given the overwhelming amount of debt that we have in the system is is you know undeniable, but also uh, you know there is no way around this this situation outside of of creating inflation uh, to uh, to get out of this this issue. And so as we see this this path moving forward, uh, I think it's always important to look back on on Japan. Um, and Japan is a very good roadmap for a lot of the issues we're seeing. Yes, Japanese markets are making new highs, but the stock market there is really cheap relative to the U.S. But one important thing is if you look at gold and silver and copper, all in Japanese yen terms, they're all making new highs. And if not, they're close to it. And, you know, that is an important uh, roadmap to me because I, I do think that a lot of the businesses that are linked to uh, those hard assets are basically priced for failure. And not only that, they're very distressed, particularly the, uh, the, the metals and mining industry. Uh, the same is happening with emerging markets. Uh, which you know we can go on and I have got this whole thesis in my mind about uh, what I call the AI paradox, which is related to all these technological investments we're seeing. Uh, but but anyways, I, I think that the big picture is is how many opportunities will be created here in, in the natural resource space and thinking about resource rich economies and and the risk that you're running, you know, buying what most people are talking about, which is, you know, AI related stocks and semiconductors and, you know, all sorts of things that look really expensive on a historical basis. All right. So let's, let's dig into that then. So um, what I hear you saying is um, particularly because of this higher for longer inflation outlook that you have over the, the, I'm just going to say coming decade, and we don't know exactly how long it's going to be, but it's going to be some secular duration um, that you think that hard assets and the companies that produce them are, are going to perform well. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you're saying hard assets and in and, and a lot of sectors, the companies that produce them are kind of unloved right now. So it's, it sounds like it's a little bit of a, a twofer, right, where you get companies that have really good prospects, but you're able to buy them at a really good value right now. Um, and that's in contrast to maybe AI right now, which, uh, I mean, might have good prospects, who knows, but it's hard not to argue that it's not, the hype hasn't gotten pretty extreme. And certainly the, the valuations have gotten certainly extreme. So at least in the case of these hard asset uh, producers, um, you might be able to buy tomorrow's winners uh, at bargain basement prices today. Is that kind of how you look at it? Yeah, and I think, Adam, you know, we we often talk about, in the markets you want, I know some people say you want to buy high and, and sell and sell higher, but 
you know, ultimately what we learn is that we, what you really should be trying to do is buy something low and sell high, right? But that concept, although it, it sounds so simple, it's actually really difficult to do. And the main reason for that is because psychologically, for whatever reason, investors just don't like something that is cheap. I don't know why. I mean, this is the only place in the world where um, where a system of, of valuing financial assets, when things get cheaper, people run away from it. And, and, and the investors that are able to sustain that emotional uh, stability to be able to have the conviction to, uh, to you know, deploy capital into an industry or a company or a country uh, that is distressed, at a situation that you disagree with the market because of the inefficiencies that are being caused, um, you know those are those are usually the best opportunities you can find. And so, you know, there are some 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 uh, pockets of the markets that look like that. And you know, why does a business in Brazil, you know, uh, just call it a, a financial company in Brazil, you know, trades at you know one, two, three times earnings when you have another company in the U.S. trading a you know, 50 times revenues. And so, you know, that, that that deserves some sort of premium for being in the U.S., but that spread between those two valuations is really extreme, uh, just as one example. I mean, I can give uh, more examples. Why Microsoft, you know, has, you know, a higher uh, market cap than the entire energy in, uh, sector combined, um, knowing that the entire energy sector combined makes generates more free cash flow or double the amount of free cash flow uh, than Microsoft alone. And so, you know, those are, you know, really, this is this is just those types of imbalances that are completely unsustainable. There's a reason why Warren Buffett owns a ton of, of, of oil companies today. And I, I think that that's probably going to be um, you know, translate into uh, into into higher oil prices as well at some point. And so, you know, there's there's a, I think I've never seen in my life this this disconnect of metal prices, for instance, relative to the metals and mining industry. Uh, using a similar example, if you just look at uh, Microsoft and Apple today, uh, they have seventy times the size of the overall metals and mining industry. Um, you know, I can't think of a world where we see reshoring, revamping of manufacturing, all these constructions that may happen in the future, ports and airports and all sorts of things, uh, without making the metals and mining industry at least a little more relevant than what it is today. It's basically relevant in the market. And so when I see those things, they kind of, you know, I think the the general investor that looks at something cheap, like let's just pick on metals and mining. You know what? What the usual argument is is look how these companies have done. You know they have done very poorly. They've they're they bleed it. They've been bleeding capital. They've you know their balance sheets look awful. Blah blah blah. And you know I think that the the mindset of an investor is usually always looking at the future, not the past. You now the fact that something hasn't worked for years and decades is the main reason why it should be in your radar uh, for the future. Uh, and so that that's that's how I you know approach things. And if I can find enough reasons of why, um, you know, especially the underlying metal uh, into those mining companies is supposed to be doing much better in the near future, then, you know, and then it checks all my boxes, essentially. I really want to get into that space. Uh, and, you know, we, we've built a business kind of investing in exploration. I mean, there's there's a lack of geologists, as I think I've mentioned in your in your programs in the past, but yeah. there's a lack of, of, of geologists in, in, in this industry. And that is actually causing a problem of inefficiency because, um, you know, if you invest in, in exploration, for instance, which requires a lot of technical knowledge, if there is not enough geologists out there, people don't know how to interpret the data. And so, you know, the public markets become fundamentally broken because they don't even know how to interpret data that those mining companies are putting out there. And so if you take an activist approach or or a much more you know, long-term mentality to buy those assets and, and really try to unlock value, that I think that's brilliant. And so but, but this is just one. I mean, there's there's other things in the natural resource space that can be done as well uh, that, that could be just as interesting. And the same thing can be applied even in emerging markets. You know, I, I think that... a you know, the, the political environment in emerging markets will always be a risk. That would never change. Brazil, for instance, will always be risky, politically speaking. And But there are times when markets shift their prioritization 
outside of, of, of the political risk, but into other things like being a resource rich economy. And you know, I think we're starting to see that there's a reason why Brazil is outperforming a lot of other markets. And I think that's just the beginning. I think we're going to see a lot more than that. All right. Um, well, I want to dig into exactly where you see the opportunity and, and, and where you're directing your focus as an investor in this space. Um, perhaps if you've got it handy, um, I don't know if you do or not, but you, you have a great chart there that basically shows uh, the relative valuation of commodities to the S&P, I think, or, or the equity markets mm -hmm. in general. Um, and I'm doing this from memory, but uh, I, I think that's been very depressed of late. I don't know if it started ticking up yet or not, but to me, that there's a good visualization of just sort of the opportunity set that you're talking about if the pendulum begins to shift back into this space that's, that's I'm probably over-exaggerating, but kind of unloved right now. Um, while, you're, while you're looking for that, let me just ask you a question about what you guys are doing at Crescat. So um, you have your own funds that you manage for clients, um, private client capital. Um, you're out there investing in these exploration companies, which are you know, super high risk um, because you might find gold, you might not, right? You're taking, those companies are taking the risks. But, but to your point of there being a lack of geologists, you guys have a, a, a renowned geologist as your partner, right? So you're taking kind of like a BYOG approach to this, right? You bring your own geologist. And uh, if your geologist can, can read the results, you know, well, because he's experienced, you've got an edge on the general market. Because as you said, a lot of these people don't have the talent to interpret the results correctly. Is, is, does that summarize that uh, fairly? Yeah, and I, I think I think it's it's also an issue of of lack of capital in the space, and the lack of capital, uh, you know, given the fact that there's no attention there, um, and you know, it's I think it's pretty simple to explain as far as how the industry works. I mean, that there's producing companies, developers, and exploration and royalties too, but. The more you go to the producing side, it's more de-risked, and you know those companies are usually have consistent cash flows and so forth, with some exceptions, especially at the beginning of those producing assets. But more at the end of it, or, or middle parts, they're more consistent, and you know it doesn't require a lot of technical work. Meaning a geologist doesn't need to necessarily cover those companies because it's not necessarily uh, 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 as relevant as other things. And so now if you think about what's happening in the development side, it's more engineering and it's figuring out how to going to build the mine and and how much is it going to cost and all those things. So it's much more financially savvy and engineeringly savvy uh, in that portion. Now, when you talk about exploration, it is very, very technically savvy. I mean, it, that you need to be in order to, to do very well. It's extremely risky, but... The, the whole point of this is that there are companies that drill, you know, in their property uh, and they intercept things that are mineralized, which means that they basically um, have hit something that has whatever the mineral is. And at the same time, you should be applying, increasing the, the probability of finding a deposit, right? Because you you found something mineralized. So should should have a deposit there, at least a probability of finding that should be higher than what was estimated by the market prior to those, those drill results. And what you see here is that a lot of those situations is, is that um, the company reports those numbers and actually collapses on the back of many other reasons because they have to raise money again, or because it would it, it came it ended up being a liquidity event for a certain investor. Um, and look, the probability of finding a deposit, a major deposit, actually only increased. And so either the company has to find an absolutely beast meaning of a deposit, like a perfect, you know, laid out um, um, uh, ore body, or uh, it's just going to get penalized in the markets uh, moving forward. And so it created a lot of opportunities because those types of, uh, of the puzzle, although there might not be the, the, those, those perfect ore bodies, but they're very economically uh, viable and, 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 you know, and also uh, likely to be chased by the major companies that are, that need to kind of replenish their production line. Um, now ultimately we'll get, we'll probably be uh, uh, in, in, in hot demand if you have a, a bull market in precious metals. And so, Holding those assets to me looks really attractive just from that standpoint. And it's so hard to see that because we haven't seen a bull market in the space for a really long time. But majority of the high quality assets in exploration actually are the ones that lead the way to the upside when you have a bull market in, in gold. And I think we are, you know, we're 
we're probably enter one of those because gold prices just broke out uh, recently, and you know what we're not seeing is 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 basically the the catching up that we need to see from silver, copper, even even other metals, palladium, platinum, and then you have on the other side you have the miners that have been really really lagging. Uh, and if you look at the minings to gold ratio, miners to gold ratio, they're retesting levels that we only seen in the seventies and. Look, the 70s was a great time to be invested in the space. And you know, a lot of people will say, well, the reason for this, the reason for this underperformance, it has to do with the fact that we're seeing higher costs. And look, I mean, I do my own research on this as well. And I don't, I, I think that that is a, a problem. However, you know, why does it not apply to copper miners? Why do copper miners relative to copper are diverging from gold miners relative to gold? That's a good question because the cost is not very different. Um, and I think the main reason for that is that fundamentally the gold companies actually have a much bigger deterioration of the quality of their reserves than the copper miners. And that's being reflected in the price of their assets ultimately. And so, you know, again, it's it's all opportunities, I think. Uh, and therefore why I'm, I'm, I'm so deep into the space. And not to mention that, you know, the fact that we haven't seen an M&A cycle in a very long time. And we know the need for those companies to, you know, again, to replenish their, their reserves. They, they're not finding investing in exploration. They're not finding new war. Um, and in fact, they've been depleting their, their, uh, their reserves. And, and, and not only that, but the average grade of their, their existing reserves has been declining as well. So, all those things are going to, are becoming a problem uh, fundamentally for those bigger miners that have to start buying the smaller miners to uh, increase their their businesses. And so uh, I've never seen in my career a time that is better to be doing a, a kind of an acquisitive, um, you know, uh, a strategy, kind of a roll up strategy than today. I mean, this is you know as good as it gets in my opinion. Um, you know, prices are are very low, and it's it's it's. You know, there are major companies looking even to sell some of their assets, which is crazy. Um, and, you know, look, I mean, it's, you know, for, for people that are opportunistic, this is as good as it gets, I think. All right. As good as it gets for people who are opportunistic. And um, let me know if you're able to find that chart. If not, no worries. I'll, I'll track it down I later on. Here. Okay, great. Uh, um, but uh, uh, so let's let's specifically talk about gold, and then then we'll wrap up by talking about any other commodity areas that that particularly you know uh, you, you think are particularly well positioned to to ride this this new era you think that we have. So uh, presumably, gold should demand for gold should go up in an inflationary environment, right? Um, you know that being said, gold gold did pretty well as inflation started. Um, uh, taking off when we had you know nine percent uh, reported CPI, um, you know it, it did well by kind of hanging in there. You know it didn't run off to the races the way that a lot of uh, uh, a lot of long time you know gold holders would have expected. You know with the CPI that that high, um, but it didn't go down like a lot of other assets did in in twenty twenty two. Would you expect gold to you know to perform better than it is right now in in this inflationary decade coming up? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because the, the gold community that's been in the business for a very long time, but don't follow macro, they always think that gold should follow inflation because that's what happened in the 70s and during those periods. Um, but then the, the more recent macro community would argue against that. They would say, no, gold should not go up because of an expectation of inflation going higher. Gold goes up because of monetary dilution and all sorts of things. And maybe real rates is the main reason. Look, I, I don't think anybody knows the answer for this, but I'll I'll try to answer the question. I think, I think since 2021, there has been some major changes in correlations in, in across macro assets. Um, you know, 2021, I call it that kind of a or the post-COVID world. Um, is has been kind of a fundamental shift in the markets in terms of 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 correlations. And the main reason for that is because we started to see interest rates rise. And we haven't seen this in a very long time. And, and the main reason for that, although the Fed had to, you know, hike rates and so forth, it was really because of the overwhelming amount of debt and the level of issuances that we've seen uh, in, 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 in the treasury market over the last years that really uh, kind of uh, uh, flooded the market and caused interest rates to rise to degrees that we're seeing currently. And 
you know, to a certain point, you know, that 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 break of correlation where real rates decline uh, and actually cause gold to rise has been always uh, a relationship that people have really relied on. And then all of a sudden that relationship breaks where gold becomes very resilient and rates go up in 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 real terms and nominal terms. And you know, it, it went up substantially. Um and you know, if you looked at even global bonds, you know, just looking at the overall aggregate of global bonds, used to track gold really closely. It completely collapsed. I'll tell you another one that used to be a safe haven like gold, Japanese yen. The Japanese yen collapsed. And so all these things is starting to happen. Uh, we saw that growth to value rotation, if you recall, as well, which was in line with, with those issues. And then came in uh, 2023 and 2023, we kind of saw the opposite of a lot of those things. And, you know, the market went up back to new highs and, uh, you know, we're back to the speculative environment because of AI and other things and the reckless amount of fiscal spending. Uh, interest rates are still really high. Uh, and so I think there's been a, a, a difficult uh, uh, shift in terms of markets or investors uh, interpreting the data uh, into into inflation means gold should go higher. But I think this is starting to change now. It's really interesting that inflation is starting to show signs of, of reacceleration again from many fronts that, as I pointed out here in, in a, a couple minutes ago, and at the same time, gold is starting to break out. So, you know, I think that that's just starting to change. So the, the gold bugs that used to think that, if, you know, gold goes up because inflation expectation is going higher, they might be right now. It might, it might be the case that that's exactly what gold is pricing in, is that, that we're going to see a reacceleration of inflation. Uh, another thing that um, I would say that got lost in the last decade has been the fact that, you know, the fact that we saw all this, this money printing and supposedly we didn't see inflation on the CPI numbers, right? We saw inflation in financial assets and other things. But CPI didn't go up. And so a lot of people said, well, that correlation is broken. You can print money and inflation doesn't come in. And then comes in COVID where they print a ton of money or if you don't want to use that term technically, you just want to say expansion of the monetary base. Um, and in line with as well, coinciding with the number of, of the amount of, of fiscal spending that created inflation. Uh, and today we're seeing one of the most restrictive monetary policies we've seen in many years, supposedly. Um, and even on the back of that, monetary base is actually increasing today by about $400 billion just recently. And so it, what would you expect that to, uh, uh, to, uh, to be if, if we have a recessionary environment where the Fed is actually forced to do all these other things? So basically we're having QE without calling it QE. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just really, really what it is. Um, and, you know, people really try to get the nitty gritty of the technical terms of all this. But, you know, if you're creating a banking facility to support the banks and 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 using the repo market, uh, you know, and, and, and all sorts of tools just to uh, just to uh, to prop up uh, your your economy. I think that's, you know, that's just another way of, of calling a stimulative process of your monetary policy. And so. You know, those things have been uh, certainly playing a role into gold markets, in my view. And uh, I've never seen a gold market that doesn't lead to other commodities having a bull market. So this is why I get really excited, because I think ultimately it's going to drive all those things. And it will trickle down to the businesses, too, that are, uh, you know, that, that, that invest in those underlying commodities. All right. So gold, you know, could be no guarantees, but gold could be if this breakout has legs. Um and, and things play out the way you think they will. It, it could be uh, the the lead sled dog that begins to bring uh, the other commodities along with it. So we're looking at this chart here of yours, right, which shows um, peaks and troughs of the commodities to equity ratio. And uh, for the past geez, fourteen, yeah, no, sorry, sixteen years, um, it's been on a, a, a steady decline uh, coming down from the, the peak that it, it hit during the global financial crisis. It may have troughed here. Um, it kind of looks here at the last wiggle that it's kind of picking itself up off the floor. Um, you are basically saying uh, you're seeing a setup like we saw in the early 70s, um, where this ratio just rocketed from, you know, like the 1% range up to like a nine, you know, like a nine X increase. Um, but you're saying from an even bigger imbalance. So we might even see bigger moves than we've seen in the past year. Um, 
uh, any commentary you want to say about this chart? I mean, it sort of well, tends to speak for itself. It just says, hey, they seem dirt cheap on a relative basis to equities. It speaks for itself, but a lot of people, like I said, the, the, the concept of buying low and selling high is much simpler than what it is. A person who looks at this chart usually says, you know, we'll come up with an excuse of why equities should go higher and commodities should go lower. In fact, the usual reason that people use looking at this mark and this chart to uh, to claim that is to say, well, look, you, I, you could have set that in 2014, 2015, and it kept going lower. Um, and that's certainly the case. I think it's all about risk reward. You know, how much risk are you taking versus how much reward is there? And, you know, when I think about what's happening in the market, especially in the gold, gold space, to me, the, the gold, understanding the gold market is almost understanding like in, the, your views about inflation. Those are fundamental questions to then invest. Mm -hmm. And I, the reason why I'm so bullish on gold, uh, well, there are plenty. Um, you know, recently, let's just talk about what's going on recently. You know, gold is surging in prices. Everyone is, you know, trying to, you know, understand what, what's happening. And then they go look at the ETF, GLD, um, the most liquid ETF in the world. They go there and they realize that the assets under management of the ETF are declining as gold makes new high. Well, the ETF itself is designed to go up when gold prices go up. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. But general investors are not deploying capital into the ETF. Therefore, you're seeing a decline of uh, assets under management. And it begs the question, then what's going on? How is gold going up? Well, the main reason for that is because central banks are probably buying gold. And, you know, gold is it used to be, uh, you know, 75% of central bank assets back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then we went through our central banks, those institutions went through a buying spree of treasuries and other sovereign institutions. And now gold is less than 20% of their of their of their their assets. And so when you think about inflation staying higher for longer, monetary debasement being a big theme, what does that cause? That caused monetary instability. And ultimately that drives central banks to buy gold. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing record amounts of, of central banks buying gold. So the big question now would be, is that sustainable? Would they keep that going? And the answer for me is probably because you know, they used to own, in average, used to be 40% of their assets used to be gold, and today is less than 20%. So they can double what they are currently own of their assets uh, in, in that. And so, you know, to me, that's uh, that's an important uh, uh, value proposition for the metal. The second one that I would point out is, here is a chart that, that shows that well, is what's going on with 60-40 uh, portfolios. I mean, 60-40 portfolios are probably one of the most uh, you know, traditional ways of allocate capital. And, and we often hear about them because uh, it worked really well and it's reflected in this. So basically in this white line, you're just seeing what is the cost of a, uh, a valuation of the, of, 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 of a 60, 40 portfolio. So I'm looking at the earnings yield. So the lower the line goes, the more expensive it gets, the higher it goes, it actually provides more earnings yield. So it's cheaper. And so you can see that you have this big trends. It's going back to the 1893. So, you know, centuries of data. And you can see clearly here that those big secular trends were probably just reached one of them, actually, at the very uh, bottom of that, which was the lowest yield in 130 years. And I'm using 40% weight on U.S. treasuries and then 60% weight on S&P 500 earnings yield. So we've had a repricing in the treasury side but not really a repricing on the equity side. And so mm -hmm. it begs the question again, will traditional portfolios look more like this, 60-40s, in 10 years from now, or will they be more balanced and maybe have 5% of gold, 2%, 3% of Bitcoin, I don't know, 2% uh, of silver or whatever. Um, usually the best way to kind of understand what the tendency is of investors doing something Watch what central banks do. Those big institutions tend to kind of <laughs> follow what central banks do. In fact, that's what happened with treasuries. We went through a, one of the longest declining interest rate environments in history because central banks have started to buy sovereign debt. And then large institutions, pension funds and so forth, they started to buy that too. And I think we're going to go to something similar, but on the gold side. And I'm not claiming gold is going to be 40% of the portfolio. But when you see this last chart real quick, which is uh, U.S. Treasuries versus gold, uh, and you you can see clearly in this chart, 
it's the first time in 45 years that uh, treasuries have a higher volatility than gold. Wow. Um, you know, it, it's just it, probably central banks are not prioritizing volatility necessarily in this case. But I would think that most of those traditional portfolios that want protection to their portfolios are probably going to be looking at this in a few years and say, yeah, well, I probably need a little bit more gold. And so, you know, I'm not, again, I don't think it will be 40% of a portfolio, but I don't think it will be zero. And and today that's that's the case. You now we most of most uh, allocators own zero percent of gold. Uh, I don't have another chart here, but there was another important chart that I can show later that shows the allocation of of gold across most financial advisors today, which is basically zero uh, percent of them own you know ten percent or more, and which is which is crazy. Back in the seventies, that used to be a normal thing to own ten percent of gold. Um, so obviously, if you said earlier that central banks are holding about 20% in gold, and, and they used to hold more like 40. Um, you're saying that uh, re the retail you know, investor used to hold somewhere up to 10% um, and now owns zero pretty much on average. Um, yeah. So if, if, if central banks were to buy more, I was going to ask you when you mentioned that, you know, they could theoretically bring it up to 40, you know, probably not, but, but they could increase what they have. Um, but theoretically, if they increased it to forty, what would that do to the gold price? I think it would probably dramatically accelerate it. And what would what would happen if retail portfolios, you know, went from zero to even two percent? Right. I mean that that would that would probably overwhelm the gold market as well, too. I don't have uh, the chart here. If you give me a second, I'll get you a chart. Uh, well, but here it is. I did the calculation that you just asked, essentially. So if you look at the global central bank history of holdings of gold. And here is 1970s all the way to 2023. And you can see here that back in the 70s it used to be a way above, well above, uh, uh, you know, 45% or so. And then we saw this declining trend, which was caused by some central banks selling gold and others buying sovereign debt. And, you know, U.S. Treasury issued a ton of debt during that period. Um, other central banks purchased treasuries. In fact, the most credible monetary systems in the world just a few years ago were the ones that held a bunch of U.S. treasuries because that's the most we used to be the most credible uh, and lowest volatility instrument you could own in the world. That has changed. That was that change, that pivotal moment that we saw back in the COVID era uh, or post-COVID era is is what's you know changed that that the profile and the risk that is associated with owning treasuries. And so you ask the question, how much would that add? Well, look, it would be about $3.2 trillion. But keep in mind that they're also increasing the size of their overall uh, balance sheet. So, you know, so they increased the, the size of the balance sheet. I'll give you an example. PBOC, since September, increased their balance sheet by $840 billion, almost a trillion dollars increase. This is not anywhere in a Wall Street Journal. I don't see anybody talking about this. It is a real bazooka of monetary stimulus that we're seeing from the PBOC. The time to be short China, the time to be you know bearish on China was five years ago, not now. <laughs> it's just, they are printing money like there's no tomorrow. And so uh, I, I, get, I get concerned about that because I think that's translating into higher gold prices as well. It's one way to kind of think about that. And so... You know, it would add about three point two trillion dollars to to uh, in central bank uh, purchases if we see them going back to to uh, uh, to this uh, forty percent average. Now, let me bring another point because right. recently, and, and, and sorry, sorry to interrupt, but what what is the current size of of the gold market? I I, I hear it oftentimes it's like seven or eight trillion. Well, that's a good point. So, uh, I think right now it's between it might be thirteen or twelve. Uh, trillion dollars. But the more important data is that since October, everyone talks, I mean, especially the crypto community, I have nothing against the crypto community, by the way, but usually they like to talk about how Bitcoin is going to eclipse gold, right? That's been one of the main points of uh, a lot of the, 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 the Bitcoiners out there. Now, think about this. Gold since October increased its value by about $2 trillion, okay? Since October, $2 trillion is is twice the size of Bitcoin, is the entire crypto market, 
it is a whole NVIDIA. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just to give you some perspective. Yes, from an appreciation perspective, I wouldn't expect being rich buying gold. Like this, this new generation that is so speculative that they want to make money tomorrow, they probably won't be uh, attracted to gold. That's not what the, the community of investors would be attracted by. Who buys gold is usually a central bank that is looking for something solid that has, you know, centuries of history of, of, of being a credible uh, way of improving the quality of your reserves. Um, and also some of those 60, 40 portfolios that are looking for a protective asset. And so those are gonna be probably the higher demand uh, 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 pools of capital that will be chasing gold first and foremost. Now, where I get excited, almost as, as excited as usually the younger <laughs> generation mm -hmm. does with other things, is that it's hard to believe that we're gonna see such uh, an important appreciation of gold prices, regardless if, if even if it's double from here, let's just call it double, uh, you know, in, in the next 10 years. How do you think a mining company would be trading? How would that be re-rated as a business? Uh, how much would that change the, the, the you know, the, what would be the appreciation of, of the market cap of a business that is in that, in that, um, in, in, in the business of, of mining gold or silver or copper? And uh, what would, the gold to silver ratio be if we have that and would that be 90 would silver really be trading at 20 dollars an ounce or would it be trading at 50 and if i'm buying a project today that produces silver should i be thinking about that and hypothetically how would this the economics uh, economics of this this business look like if silver is at 50 that's kind of where my mindset is you know I, i'm trying to think about this you know how would the, everything look like if we have a world where gold is, you know, significantly higher from here, silver is pushed higher because I've never seen gold move higher substantially that is not driven by silver. Um, and then ultimately, what what happens with all these distress opportunities that are really high quality in some cases that nobody that is just being neglected for so long and completely unloved. And so, you know, I I've uh, maybe I can attract some of the younger crowd to, to, uh, to the space, but it's, uh, to me, this is where, uh, you know, I, I don't go to a, a restaurant or a bar and I hear people talking about their, you know, acquiring claims and properties and all sorts of things to, to look for minerals. And, you know, to me, I think at the end of this decade, I think maybe this idea will look a little more obvious than what it is currently. All right. Fantastic. All right. Well, look, Tavi, we're going to have to, to, to wrap it up at that. I think it's a great point to, to, to end this on because if indeed, this is the trajectory we continue going on. I'm going to want to have you back on the program many times in the future to update folks as to sort of where we are in the story and where you're seeing in which sectors the real opportunity, you know, at, the, at any given moment in time. But, you know, what you've sort of laid for us here is that, you know, gold is is at the vanguard, hopefully, of driving the rest of the commodity complex higher. It's got a very bright future for all the reasons that you just mentioned here. And, you know, you're very excited about the deep values that the the, the precious metals miners offer right now. Um, I want to just let folks know that um, if you didn't uh, watch or participate in the uh, Thoughtful Money conference uh, from a week ago, um, we had uh, uh, two great um, mining analysts. So one, the legendary Rick Rule. Uh, and also Jeff Clark, um, both of them shared their uh, top picks right now in the precious metals mining space. Um, Rick also shared a bunch of other names and a bunch of other uh, commodity sectors as well. Um, but if you are you know, intrigued by what, uh, inspired by what Tavi's mentioned here and you're looking for ideas, um, that's one uh, resource you can use. And if you, if you didn't attend the conference, you can still buy the replay videos over at thoughtfulmoney.com slash conference. Um, all right. Well, Tavi, look, in, in wrapping up here, um, uh, I, I didn't get time to get to, and I don't want to do short shrift, but which is, you know, what are some of the other commodity complexes that you're really excited about? Um, we'll have you back on to go into those in, in depth here. Um, for folks that have really enjoyed um, your analysis here, um, I'm sure once they saw some of your charts here, they were like, oh, this is the guy who does those charts. I know this guy. <laughs> um, uh, where can they follow you and your work going forward? Uh, you can follow my work at, uh, on Twitter at Tavi Costa or also in our website, cresca.net. You can find a bunch of research there as well that we put out. But I appreciate the uh, the invite to to be part of this and, and congrats, Adam, on your new endeavors. It's um, I'm happy for you. Oh, gosh. Well, it's such a pleasure. Um, huge fan, Tavi. Big privilege to have you on here. Um, real quick, uh, I've got one last question I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to give you 
about 45 seconds to think about it. And I didn't prep you on this. So this is a curveball. Um, we've been talking all about commodities in the context of making money, preserving financial wealth. Um, what's one non-money related investment that you would encourage folks to adopt in their lives? Um, so chew on that for 45 seconds. Folks, uh, if you would indeed like Tavi to come back on um, when he's got another important update for us uh, in this whole commodity sector, please let him know by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. And, um, you know, uh, Tavi has sort of mentioned this, this arc of, uh, you know, potential uh, uh, bull cycle in commodities. You might have even heard some people refer to it as a coming super cycle in, in commodities. And obviously, if, if the chart that he showed earlier about how undervalued they are right now relative to equities, if that starts getting back even to its historic mean, that's going to be a pretty massive move. Um, so if you're trying to figure out you know, ways in which you might want to increase exposure to your portfolio about that and ways to play that, um, commodity space, I mean, it... it, it, it <laughs> There can be lots of opportunity there, but if you don't know what you're doing, you can also lose your shirt pretty fast. Um, anybody that's held some of these precious metals mining shares that Tavi and I have been talking about, especially in, in the uh, more junior stage, they've got the, the scars to prove it. So highly recommend if you think that you want to start getting involved in the space, especially if you have no experience in it, work under the guidance of a good professional uh, financial advisor who takes into account all the macro topics that that Tavi and I talked about here and that the the regular guests on this channel and I talk about, but also has experience investing in these sectors. If you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them. Uh, but if you don't, or you'd like uh, to get a second opinion uh, from one who does, feel free to talk to one of the advisors that uh, Thoughtful Money endorses. These are the ones that you see every week with me on this channel. Uh, to set up one of those free consultations, just go to thoughtfulmoney.com, fill out the short form there. Uh, you'll get bespoke, personally customized uh, advice from them. Um, uh, there's no cost to these consultations. Uh, there's no commitment to work with them. It's just a free public service that they offer. All right, Tavi, we're now back to you. Um, what is one non-monetary investment that you'd encourage folks to consider? Well, um, I think it's to seek truth through having independent views. I mean, that's is, is kind of been my mode of, of, of analysis and mode of, of living life has been really uh, not trying to be, uh, you know, strongly politically weighted on anything and always being very open-minded to ideas. Um, and I think that has been serving me well in my life. And I, I hope to be that way as much as possible. And I hope my, I have a, a young daughter now and I hope that I can, teach her how to how to do that as well to be very have a very independent view and being forced to respect other opinions but also really try to seek the truth rather than what is um, perceived as being the truth and and it's not an easy task it sounds easier than what it is I mean it's, it's really driving your curiosity whatever if it's money related then you know it, it really is understanding markets and looking at real data rather than just uh, reading, uh, you know, newspapers and, and the news. And a lot of times, you know, what I do, even, even from a work perspective is, you know, reading news and the data and really trying to drive my own analysis, my own view, and then seeing other analysts' views about that certain topic. And it, it's interesting how the more you do that, the less you, uh, uh, the more you understand the market because you become more curious and not just a market, but a topic in general. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and you start creating some really interesting opinions that a lot of people have never heard of because because it's it's truly being independently driven. And so um, I've I've always been of of the view that you know independent opinions is very rare to find in markets. Analysts, when you look for analysts to work for you or all sorts of things, rarely they have very independent views. And if you think about most of the successful people in the world. Uh, they're really good at, at having their own opinions on things, and they're usually seeking the truth, and not 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 just to be uh, you know not not just to be right on a on an argument on a you know on on a, on you know with your friends. I mean, but but really trying to be to finding what's the what's the right answer for something. And you know, to me, that's uh, it's something I really enjoy, kind of to to live by. That's an excellent answer, Tavi. And I'm, I'm honestly kind of surprised. I've been doing this for over two months now. Nobody's brought that one up yet. And I think that's 
super valuable in general, but certainly in the space of of being an analyst, right? Um, you know, this ability to keep an open mind. Uh, there's a famous axiom, and I'm I'm sure I'm murdering it, but it's something like the sign of an educated mind is is the ability to keep two opposing ideas in your head at the same time, right? Uh, and be cognizant that that you know your position might be the wrong one, the other might be right, or that the truth may lie somewhere in between the two, right? And it's so challenging in the modern environment with digital media, where uh, it's so easy for us to construct a, a really comfortable, perfect little echo chamber that just tells us what we want to hear all the time, right? And, and validate our way of thinking. Super important to get yourself out of that um, and to make sure that you are uh, always challenging what you feel so strongly about with, uh, you know, hopefully well-informed or, or, or well-constructed opposite uh, arguments to the opposite so that you you know are always you know keeping your your overconfidence in check and to your point hopefully dialing in more on the truth so thank you for that i love that um all right tabby well look uh wonderful as always i'm sorry the clock ran out on us here we'll definitely have you back on again in the future and anytime that you see something materially happening uh in the commodity markets that you want to get uh you know more widely appreciated please come back on this channel thanks for having me i really appreciate that thank you all right. Such a pleasure. And folks, if you enjoyed this, again, hit that like button. Tavi, thanks so much. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.